Good day and welcome to this, the third of a series of videos on the history of Anglicanism in the 17th century. My name is Ross Hebb. The second video, our last video, ended with the uh, end of the Civil War period. Uh, and the Civil War period was from 1640 to 1660 in England. Now, the way in which things came to an end uh, was, of course, with the death of Oliver Cromwell in September of 1658. And what had been the case, he had been the Lord Protector of England uh, for the last decade or so, and it was he and his new model army, which was basically the power that allowed him to be in charge, a sort of military dictatorship, uh, that uh, came to an end with his death. Now his son Richard tried to continue things on, but he didn't have the force of personality or the reputation or the charisma of Cromwell uh, to carry on, and so things fell to the different generals within the army. And then finally, General Monk, one of the generals in the new model army, took control of things. Uh, he uh, sent the uh, rump parliament uh, packing, and then eventually uh, recalled all of the long parliament, and it appeared at that point that the only way forward uh, for the restoration of political, social, and religious stability within England was to recall the king, to recall the successor to the throne, uh, the son of the man who they beheaded, namely Charles II. Now, this meant that Parliament and General Monk were opting for a return of a king and monarchy within England. They were opting for the Church of England, certainly in some form, to be restored, which also meant rule or governance of the church by bishops in some form. It also, they realized, meant the bringing back of the Book of Common Prayer, which had been illegal in recent years, and also a some sort of new negotiated relationship between the power of the monarchy and the parliament. So that's what they were opting for when they asked Charles II to come back to England. Now Charles II had been brought up in the continent. He had had Anglican advisors and Anglican tutors and Anglican chaplains. So he was quite dedicated at this point to the Book of Common Prayer and to the Church of England. And from Holland, uh, he issued what's known to history as the Declaration of Breda, B-R-E-D-A. And it was an extraordinary document because these were extraordinary times. Uh, the past king had been beheaded, parliament had ruled and had become a military dictatorship. How were things going to come back together? And in this Declaration of Breda, Charles II promised a pardon to basically everyone involved in the Civil War period except to those who were directly responsible for the execution of Charles I, the, those who signed his death warrant uh, and who were known as the regicides, the king killers. He also promised with respect to uh, religion to respect those of tender consciences. Uh, and, but also there was this notion very clearly that came through in the declaration that as it had been said decades earlier, uh, no bishops, no king. So now there'd be no king unless the bishops would come back too. And so Charles came back, Charles II came back to England. Uh, Parliament passed an act of indemnity and oblivion. And this is an, a very important document, uh, in, particularly in light of the day and age in which we live and true from reconciliation uh, documents and the such like, uh, because uh, in this act of indemnity and oblivion, it made it official that only the regicides and the the absolute frontline leaders of uh, the rebellion against the king would be punished. Uh, but also, uh, not only did it grant a pardon to everyone else, it also made it illegal to preach or to publish pamphlets about the past disturbances, one side blaming the other. So even the victors could not write pamphlets or preach sermons against those who had been responsible for the interregnum. So that was an extraordinary attempt, an official attempt, uh, to do uh, what had to be done with the past, a minimum, and not to leave the past overshadow and rule the future. Uh, there was an admission of the past, and there was to be this reconciliation of not dragging up past wrongs, because both sides had a great deal that they could drag up. 
Now, interestingly, in the year 1661, uh, the more radical Protestants of in London uh, rebelled temporarily, and that was suppressed. And then there was a parliamentary election. And partially due to that rebellion that was suppressed, uh, a very pro-church and pro-monarchy parliament was came back to London, known as the Cavalier Parliament, and it was elected in the spring of 1661. And this Cavalier Parliament was very much pro-king and pro-Church of England, and more of that in a few moments. But also, just like in the past, when James I came down to England from Scotland to be the first of the Stuart monarchs on the throne, and he was met by the Puritan divines, and that produced the Hampton Court Conference to consider matters of religion, so too, when Charles II comes back to England, he was met by a delegation of Puritan and Presbyterian-minded clergy uh, asking for uh, something other than simply the restoration of the prayer book the way it had been, and the Church of England in the way it had been. Uh, and so this produced what's known in the history as the Savoy Conference. And the Savoy Conference met in London in April of 1661. And on the one side, just like in the Hampton Court Conference, there were 12 Anglican bishops. And in the other side, there were 12 Puritan and Presbyterian divines. Uh, and the king didn't set in judgment of this. The Bishop of London uh, was the man who was in charge because the Bishop of Canterbury uh, was too ill at that point. He was very elderly. And so there was a Savoy Conference. And the Puritan and Presbyterian-minded uh, divines brought up the list of old objections, which included their objection to the clergy wearing the surplice. It objected again to the use of the sign of the cross at holy baptism. They objected strenuously also to the concept of kneeling to receive Holy Communion. Also, within the prayer book, they wanted the term priest removed and replaced by minister, and they wanted the word Sunday removed as well and replaced with the term the Lord's Day. Now, the Anglican uh, bishops who sat uh, on the Savoy Conference insisted that the Puritans and Presbyterians write down all their objections, and they produced a very lengthy uh, document, which has come down to us, and the bishops responded to these various objections. And it's very uh, important for us to uh, hear some of the Anglican bishops' responses to these objections. Now, for instance, one of the things that they objected to was the notion that everybody who was brought to the church, a child brought to the church by parents, uh, were to be baptized by the local clergyman. And the Puritans and the Presbyterians objected to this. They thought, well, you know, if the parents are bad living people, uh, surely the goodness the priest should have the right, or the minister should have the right, to refuse baptism of the child. And this is the way in which the bishops responded and how they uh, reasoned in their response. We think this desire, they said, to be very hard and uncharitable, punishing the poor infants for the parents' sakes, and giving also too great and arbitrary a power to judge which of his parishioners he gained uh, judged to be worthy, and which were atheists, etc., and then in that name to reject their children from being baptized. Our church, the bishops concluded, uh, says uh, and proceeds more charitably that Christ will favorably accept every infant brought to baptism that is presented to the church according to our present order, the one found in the prayer book. And this she concludes out of Holy Scriptures, as you can see from referencing to the baptism service in the prayer book, according to the practice and doctrine of the ancient Catholic Church. So that's how they reasoned on that subject of refusing baptism of children. Now, the, the other thing which uh, the Puritan and Presbyterian divines objected to was a notion of kneeling to receive Holy Communion. And they said that was an error. Now, the bishops responded to that objection in this manner. We conceive it an error to say that the scripture affirms that the apostles received not kneeling. The posture at the Last Supper we know, but the institution of the Holy Sacrament was after the Supper, and what posture was in you, Scripture doesn't tell us. Moreover, the posture of kneeling best suits at the communion as the most convenient and so most decent for us when we are to receive, as it were, from God's hand the greatest of seals of the kingdom of heaven. 
He that thinks he may do this sitting, let him remember what the prophet Malachi said. Offer this to the prince to receive his seal from his own hand sitting. See if he will accept it. Now to stand at communion, when we kneel at prayers, we're not decent, much less to sit, which was never the use and the best of the ancient times. That's how the Anglican bishops answer this objection. You see, the use of scripture, but also the use of reason, and also the use of ancient practice of the Christian church. And then finally, uh, the Puritan divines objected to saints days, saying they were uh, non-biblical. Now, to this the bishops responded, the observation of saints days is not as of divine but ecclesiastical institution, that is it's something that the Christian church down through the centuries has come up with, and therefore it's not necessary that they should have any other ground in scripture than all other institutions of the same nature, so that they may be agreeable to scripture in the general and for promoting of piety. So that is to say that not everything done in the church or by the church has to be directly out of Scripture. Uh, they can be not contrary to Scripture, and also they can promote piety. Therefore, they're useful and allowed. And the observance of them was an ancient uh, practice, that is, saints' days, uh, as appears from the ancient liturgies and uh, church service books. And besides this, they point out, our Savior himself kept a feast of the church's institution, namely the Feast of the Dedication. And the reference there is to John's Gospel, chapter uh, 7, verse 22. So that's how the bishops reasoned against or in answer to these Puritan and Presbyterian objections. In the end, the prayer book which was produced after the Savoy Conference, known as the 1662 prayer book, the classic uh, Anglican prayer book of history, and the one which was per to persist down into the 20th century, uh, was one uh, which wasn't significantly altered due to uh, the Puritan and Presbyterian objections. Yes, there were some new colics introduced, written by Bishop Cozen, there were some updating of colics, and there was a new service introduced, baptism for those of riper years. That is to say, those who had come of age during the 20-year period of the Civil War and the Interregnum, uh, many individuals were not baptized as children, therefore there had to be an adult baptism service included, and that's what it means by those of riper years. And so that's the outcome of the Savoy Conference, very similar overall to the outcome of the Hampton Court Conference of so many decades earlier. Now, speaking of how things were done earlier, back at the time of the Reformation and uh, in the time of Edward and of Queen Elizabeth of blessed memory, Parliament passed an act of uniformity so that the new prayer book would become the official and to be used service book in all the Church of England throughout the entire realm from this point forward. And so the act of uniformity of 1662 enforced usage of the slightly alterated prayer book, the 1662 one. But also it made sure that those uh, clergy were to take an oath against taking up arms against the king. We see the application of that coming out of the Civil War. And also, uh, they insisted that any clergyman who was going to stay in a parish had to not only use the prayer book and also swear this oath, but also they had to be episcopally ordained. That is, Presbyterian or Puritan ordination, whatever that might look like, wasn't sufficient. They had to be actually ordained by a bishop. And that was a problem for some clergy who ended up in parishes during the interregnum period. And history tells us that about out of the roughly 10,000 clergy in England, 1,800 were not able to take this oath or to comply, and they were out of the parishes. And so that's the Act of Uniformity and the 1662 Prayer Book. Now, it's very important to note at this point that for King Charles II, and for most of the bishops of the Church of England, they thought this was sufficient reintroduction of the prayer book and of uh, uniformity into the English nation. 
But, as it turned out, this parliament that was returned uh, in 1661, the Cavalier Parliament, was uh, not of a mind to compromise. These were uh, very much Anglican gentry and parliamentarians, and they wanted to ensure that the prayer book not only was back and in use, but enforced in the strictest manner possible. And so the parliament introduced a number of uh, pieces of legislation over the next couple of years uh, to even more forcefully uh, insist on the use of the prayer book and the suppression of Puritanism and Presbyterianism within the English nation. Now, the first of these was a Corporation Act passed in 1661. Now, this barred non-Anglicans from holding civil office. It also included the clause where people had to say that the Solemn League and Covenant, which was very much the basis of the previous Puritan and Presbyterian uh, status in church and state, that it was an illegal oath and you were no longer bound by it. Also, this Corporation Act made sure that uh, people took an oath against bearing arms against the uh, king. And then finally, for it to hold civil offices, to be an MP or to be a justice of the peace or anything, not only did you have to uh, swear against the solemn league and covenant, swear an oath not to take up arms against the king, but also you had to be a communicant member of the Anglican Church which, of course, in effect, any Presbyterian or Puritan who wasn't attending and wasn't taking communion couldn't hold civil office in England, and that was a strict new measure. Now, this, as if the Corporation Act wasn't strict enough, uh, strict enough in order to ban non-Anglicans from civic-like life, there was the Conventicle Act of 1664, which made it illegal to conduct public worship or attend public worship in any but a prayer book Anglican parish. So nonconformist, as they were being called, those who didn't conform to the act of uniformity, nonconformist worship was made illegal by the Conventicle Act of 1664. And then, to make it even harder, in 1666, the Parliament passed what's known as the Five Mile Act, which made it illegal for a Puritan or Presbyterian minister to be within five miles of the previous parish or congregation in which he had ministered during the period of the Interregnum and the Civil War period. So illegal to be within five miles of his previous parish. And so these acts together, the Corporation Act, the Conventicle Act and Five Mile Act are known as the Clarendon Code, and he was the uh, main leader of the government uh, within Parliament at this period of time. And they were aimed in the spirit of non-toleration against uh, the non-Church uh, of England members of English society. Uh, and that produced a great deal of intolerance. And as I say, this was probably going beyond what Charles as King and the majority of the English bishops wanted to do uh, because they wanted to be a little bit less severe against the non-conforming members. And then finally, in 1673, there was another act passed. But with the passage of time, the concern was a little bit different then. In 1673, there was what's known as the Test Act passed by Parliament. And this was based upon a real fear of a resurgence of Roman Catholicism, not so much within the nation, but within the royal court. Because Charles I was being uh, uh, coming under influences that were pro-Roman, and the successor to the throne, James II, was an obvious and publicly a Roman Catholic. And when Charles died, James, being the next steward in line, was succeeded to the throne, and he was obviously and openly a Roman Catholic. So the Test Act was aimed at Englishmen, and it was required them uh, to take an oath of supremacy, recognizing the royal supremacy, uh, but of an Anglican, and also an uh, oath of allegiance uh, to the crown and to the status quo. And also, it required individuals within the realm to prove that they were a prayer book communicant. So this was designed as previous uh, 
uh, Clarendon Code was designed to focus in on uh, nonconformists, Protestants. This test act was designed to focus in on closet Roman Catholics, the people who were really Roman Catholic at heart. And these oaths and proving you were a prayer book communicant were designed to weed those people out uh, from public offices and have them identified as being publicly Roman Catholic. And so this was the test act of 1673. And then finally, when Charles did die as king on his deathbed, he became a Roman Catholic. And that, of course, accelerated the fears of what does the future hold? We've managed to contain the threat of nonconformity within England, but when the royal court and the successor to the throne is going to be openly Roman Catholic, that presents another problem. Now, having reached this point, basically at the end of Charles II's reign, uh, there's uh, a need for us to stand back for a moment and assess what has taken place. We entered into the century with a state status where the understanding was that all Englishmen should be of the same denomination as the crown, and that would be Church of England. Now, there were many members within the Church of England at the end of Elizabeth's reign and beginning of James I and on through the Charles I who were within the Church of England and were Puritan-minded or leaned in that direction strongly or were attracted to Presbyterianism. But they're all contained within the Church of England and they fought for the soul of the Church of England within the Church of England. Now, after the Civil War period and the extraordinary uh, restoration of the monarchy and of the Church of England, there was an admission of a new fact, that there were others within the nation. And the others within the nation were not Church of England members. There were various forms of nonconformity, that is, those who could not take, uh, uh, submit to the Act of Uniformity of 1661. They were Puritan-minded, or they were outright Presbyterians. And then also later on, it became clear that there were uh, Roman Catholics within the realm, uh, within the royal court, and within the aristocracy uh, that were Roman Catholic at heart. And so there is an admission by the end of the century that the English nation contains and will contain going into the future members who are outside of the Church of England. On the one hand, nonconformity, Presbyterians, Puritans, Congregationalists, etc. And then also those who are of the Roman Catholic persuasion uh, that pose a threat because many foreign nations are also Roman Catholic and the fear of the restoration of uh, Roman Catholicism, uh, resurgent Roman Catholicism uh, and the Counter-Reformation Counter uh, is a threat to the stability of the English nation. And so that's the uh, mixed bag of the reality of the new religious composition of the English nation, which uh, is admitted officially uh, post the Restoration Settlement in between 1662 and 1668. And that's where this talk today will conclude. Next week, we have to consider uh, another extraordinary event in English history. We've had the restoration of the monarchy, for the most part bloodless, in 1662. And then in 1668, we're going to see the restored Stuart monarchy kicked out of England and have a glorious revolution in which a new foreign Protestant king, William of Orange, is brought in and establishes a new reality within the English nation. Well, that's a story for our next talk. Thank you and good day.